coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. If I evolved on Lucky Charms, I wouldn't exist. I evolved on meat. Meat does, it does not cause problems in the human being. If it's a grass-fed, healthy meat, not bastardized, farm-raised garbage, just really it is a safe, healthy food. So you're never going to get me to buy that. And then you'll never get me to buy, oh my God, uh, so-and-so's cholesterol is high. The first thing you better do is cut out the eggs. I always think, and I go, wow, did that person pass organic chemistry? Because cholesterol is huge. It's a massive molecule. You're not eating the cholesterol of a chicken and just injecting it into your bloodstream and magically increasing right. your cholesterol. I'm not taking the chicken's cholesterol and magically transforming it into my own bloodstream. It's not how digestion and the human body works. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed Dr. Robert Pastori. Dr. Robert has a vast educational background with many diverse subjects. His undergrad was in organic chemistry, biochemistry, neuroscience, human nutrition, and genetics. He has counseled some of the world's greatest professional athletes and sports teams. And in this episode, we discussed a variety of topics, including his health journey with celiac disease, the symptoms of it, how he eats gluten-free, the advantages of eating an ancestral diet, and his thoughts on fasting, dairy, nuts, and meat. Dr. Robert is a brilliant guy, and I really enjoyed my episode with him. He has a ton of energy, and I know you'll enjoy it. So thanks so much for listening, and enjoy the interview. All right, welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I have a special guest, Dr. Robert Pastori, and uh, I'm excited to have you on. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much for the invite, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so we're going to touch on a lot of different things. Um, before we get into that, I know you have a, your background is fairly extensive. Perhaps just give us um, a rehash of um, you know, your background and then how you got into all of it. Sure, I'll, I'll go. This time I'll go in order. Sometimes I start backwards because I spent the most time tackling my doctorate. Um, I was diagnosed with celiac disease after a huge battle advocating for my own care um, in my late teens and forgot my formal diagnosis at 20. Maybe we could touch upon that today. Um, I definitely have talked about that in different forms. I'm extremely comfortable exploring that. And that, that really uh, sparked my interest in wanting to pursue a better understanding of how um, food could create such problems in my life. And for those of your listening audience that may not know, celiac disease is an autoimmune disease that needs some specific genetic predisposition and then a full on um, immune system assault against proteins that are found in grains known as gluten containing grains. And of course their substrates are found in numerous foods um, that we consume daily, even if they're not grains, right? They stick wheat and everything is what I've learned. Uh, and that, that really fostered a change in my mindset. I mean, I was on a fast track to want to be the youngest brain surgeon in the state of New York. And I found with my inquisitive mind, wait a minute, I was stopped in my tracks by what I'm eating. How is that possible? Uh, so then I went off to study. I got my undergraduate degree in science. So I got my bachelor's in science because I couldn't decide on a single major. Um, if you look at my background, I studied everything from biochemistry, organic chemistry, um, pre-med, uh, neuroscience, uh, genetics, the microbiology of cancer. Like my undergrad was ridiculous. I think it was 227, uh, it was 127 credit hours just in the sciences. So mm -hmm. then I had liberal arts on top of that. Um, still really was excited about nutrition, loved a doctor out of University of Connecticut named Dr. John Carbone, who's a protein researcher. He set up shop at Eastern Michigan University. And I love saying where that's located. It's Ypsilanti, which starts with a Y, if you're no, a Jeopardy fan. Did not know that. So went to Ypsilanti, Michigan, uh, got my master's degree in human nutrition, my certified uh, nutrition specialist credential, which is a separate credential that you get after like 10,000 hours of working in the field and have to have a graduate degree from a regionally accredited institution in human nutrition, et cetera. Went up through all that uh, and then came back to this love for biological medicine. So I just sped through years of my <laughs> life. Uh, but then I came back to this love and while I was at Eastern Michigan and studying nutrigenomics, I, I really connected with this doctor who I love so much named Judith Brooks, she's a PhD. And she was just so attuned to 
celiac disease and the autoimmune conditions that could come out of it and how some people could have celiac disease, but their primary symptoms are actually outside of the intestines. So that totally fascinated me. Um, I was studying the work of Rodrigo out of uh, Florida, who was looking at multiple sclerosis and Dr. Judith Brooks was looking at MS and different cases of age-related mental decline. So that led me to um, this honor society at Eastern Michigan called Phi Kappa Phi. And they said, hey, I know you're really digging this biomedicine thing. And then you kind of are interested in precision medicine, like working on an individual level. Rutgers over, uh, was in New York at the time, back in New York, across the river, has this amazing um, think tank of researchers in different types of PhD disciplines, perhaps you should pursue that. Hmm. So I spent uh, the bulk of my life over at Rutgers studying um, biomedicine and then specifically settled down on biomedical informatics, nanomedicine and clinical informatics for my doctorate. It's pretty complicated. And my wife says I sound like a Bond villain, <laughs> um, which is kind of cool. Uh, and even one of my, my professors for my dissertation sounds like she was a Bond villain, Antonina Mitrofanova. Uh, so she's probably one of the most brilliant mathematic minds. She's probably won the Nobel Prize in my lifetime. Uh, but I had the pleasure and sheer honor of studying there and um, finished top of my class and really started pursuing biological medicine. And I never let go of the reins of celiac. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so I've studied it formally, practiced it formally, and then went out and published um, on that topic. My last publication was in November of 2019 after I did a multiple year study throughout many universities. And if there's time to talk about that, however it works out, uh, on improving the diagnostics uh, for this, this horrible disease. And, and this disease, celiac, is this, would you say this is a newer disease just to, because of you know, the way things are, are made nowadays as opposed to maybe back in the day? I think there's more of a hyper awareness, at least I'm hoping there is more of a hyper awareness of the disease itself. Um, my case was considered back when I was diagnosed, um, I'm 51, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine I'm telling you, I was, I fought to get diagnosed at 19 and 20 doctors really were so clueless. And I don't mind sharing this story, Brian, it's a true story. And I don't, I don't need names to protect. I don't want to say the innocent to protect mm -hmm. the guilty. But when I got my diagnosis, I remember, um, a, a cardiologist, cause I, my actual symptoms were primarily cardiovascular. Um, so it was fascinating. The doctor goes to his medical textbook on the wall and he tore out the section of celiac disease. And I remember being so vexed by that because I, I, I walked out and said to my loved ones who were accompanying me on this final visit to make sure, you know, did he get a diagnosis? Is he going to be okay? I was that sick. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just was dumbfounded and came out and said, um, I don't think anyone else will ever get diagnosed with celiac disease in this office because I got this sheet out of the textbook. You know, keep in mind there was no internet then, right? right? So I really came along at this really cool time. I was like the last baby of the 60s, you know, born in 1969. Mm -hmm. So it was this cool time of, um, you know, you really had to hit the library and hit the books and, and, and publish literature to know what you know in a hard copy format. Um, so I just felt really bad that uh, there a lot was missing. So I kept that open, Brian, and I actually pursued other doctors that were doing published studies on questionnaires of the most knowledgeable in medicine, how much knowledge do they have in the realm of celiac disease, which causes so many diseases. And that led me to the work of a brilliant doctor out of Georgetown at the time when she published, her name is Dr. McCormick, and she published a paper in 2013 that completely blew my mind. Um, at that time, the American College of Gastroenterology, like the think tank for gastroenterologists, where the primary disease starts its immunological resonance mm -hmm. uh, and, and its genesis, she questioned about 400 doctors after they published the diagnostic criteria for celiac disease, mm -hmm. and a large percentage of them in different areas actually failed mm -hmm. in their knowledge and understanding. So I think new is in the knowledge that some doctors are getting it more on their radar by the efforts of McCormick, Zipster, and Siri, and I'd love to say myself, if I may be so bold, uh, without ego, of course, by pursuing knowledge and trying to get doctors to understand the importance of my paper. I received at least 500 phone calls after my paper was published in the Journal um, uh, of the American College of Nutrition in November. The, the electronic version, thankfully, with modern technology was out prior to the print version in November, but it came out in May. 
Mm. I received at least 500 calls from everyone from gastroenterologists to internists to endocrinologists telling me, you know, right on, this is what we need to do. And thanks for opening my eyes here. Hey, I didn't know that 83% of individuals with this disease actually are not diagnosed and they're walking around in the population mm. with this disease, you know, and it's very serious. So I feel like it's kind of picked up a little bit radar wise between 2013 and the efforts of McCormick and my other colleagues to, to present day. Um, but it is, it's a very frightening statistic that we can, we cannot ignore. And, uh, obviously there's different degrees of it. Um, what are some of the symptoms that people would, would maybe have that, you know, they're not even, you know, they might not even know they have celiac disease, but what are some of the common symptoms? I'm so glad you said that because there's different sets of symptoms. And that was another thing I went advocating um, on and, and started this like university tour and started doing lectures because there's the classic manifestations, Brian. And we know those as abdominal pain, particularly what we call postprandial, half to eat. Mm -hmm. People have like, this intense abdominal pain and then it just passes. Um, some bloating and gas and they could just blame what they ate and go out and go over the counter and start self-medicating with Tums or one of the other uh, aforementioned, you know, revealing pain, revealing agents or Nexium, et cetera. Um, diarrhea, there's a skin condition known as dermatitis hepatiformis um, that eludes a lot of doctors and a lot of people. It's like this very interesting rash. I did a whole podcast, wrote a whole article on it. Mm -hmm. I received at least a hundred calls on that one paper because doctors are just equating it with a form of dermatitis. Believe it or not, if there's a history in someone's family for uh, Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, it is indeed linked to a lineage of celiac disease. Uh, shockingly, because this fits basically, at, I love your audience and who you who you preach to, mm. basically would say, hey, I'm tired a lot. Well, fatigue and lethargy is actually a big symptom because mm. you're mobilizing the bulk of the immune system towards something you're eating. We can never forget the bulk of the human immune system resides in the gastrointestinal tract. It's right. called the gut associated tissue, abbreviated the GALT. So if you're overactivating that towards what you're eating, you will be exhausted. Um, uh, the inability to treat iron deficiency anemia, um, uh, it's refractory. Uh, this is what doctors call it, meaning they give a patient iron, they, they try to change their diet, but you can't fix their iron deficiency. It's a classic sign of celiac disease. And then a severe itchy rash or what's known as, um, not to be so graphic, I don't know what time this show is going to air, but uh, <laughs> steatorrhea, which is like a fatty floating stool. Um, that shows that you're not fully digesting your fat. So those are like the classic symptoms out of medical textbook. But what doctors may not know, and I'll whip through these, um, I have them tattooed in my brain, Brian. <laughs> there's, there's hair loss, uh, that's not male pattern baldness, and it could be like more all over the head. That happened to me. Mm. It's not, and this is all my own hair, by the way, Brian, grow my own hair. <laughs> so, alopecia, um, loss of period in young women, canker sores in the mouth, known as aphthys, ulcers or aphthys stomatitis. Um, you can have uh, ataxia, which is like a dizziness uh, period of time. You could experience early onset cognitive impairment or late stage and be blamed. And doctors could be pursuing um, early on Alzheimer's and prescribing Aricept and all that. Believe it or not, it's celiac disease. Probably the biggest one, which if anyone ever listened to my own podcast, which I haven't recorded in forever because I'm so busy, uh, dental enamel defects. Um, you have this window of time to grow enamel. And when you get your permanent teeth and you miss that window, you will have teeth problems for the rest of your life. Raising my hand, I have the mouth of an NHL player and I never was on the ice. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I put someone through Harvard with my dental bills. No. Uh, people can experience clinical depression. Uh, the bulk of immune system is in the gut, but also the bulk of our neurotransmitter substrates and neurotransmitter precursors. And sometimes whole amino acids that pass the blood brain beer is also in the gastrointestinal tract. Modern medicine teaches this as the second brain, and it's in all medical textbooks. Um, gastrointestinal abnormalities known as dyspepsia, where you're not fully unfolding proteins in the stomach, where digestion begins. The mouth is where they begin, but not for proteins. Um, fertility problems in men and women, headaches, heartburn, um, spleen activity, where you have low immune system. Believe it or not, lactose intolerance is linked to it. Elevations of liver enzymes nausea and vomiting, clinical nutritional deficiencies that doctors can't figure out why, obesity, bone loss known as osteopenia or osteoporosis, swelling of the pancreas known as pancreatitis, peripheral neuropathy, pulmonary hemosiderosis. I'm gonna let your audience Google that. Are you reading this out of a textbook? <laughs> oh, I am not. Uh, we like mirrors behind me. And then <laughs> seizure disorders, thyroid disorders, refractory kidney stones, and thyroiditis. Wow. Well, my thought when, when you read all these um, different symptoms is, is, is the diagnosis uh, 
is it easy to be diagnosed with it? Meaning like, I'm sure people think they have one thing and they have something else. Like I'm, how accurate is the diagnosis of it? Uh, it, it? If you're following the right path, it could be dead on accurate. And that is the part uh, of where my mission picks up, where I grab the baton from aforementioned McCormick and colleagues, Zipser and colleagues, and Ancillary and colleagues that said we need physician education. Um, and I can provide those references for those, by the way, because they're all of the, in, in my paper's references. And of course, Brian, I'll give you my last paper in full. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so important that we follow a pattern. So what we want to start doing when if someone, if a doctor or a patient suspects they have celiac disease is first test what's known as secretory immunoglobulin IgA. So that's an SIgA to find out where they fit on the spectrum. And you may say, hold on, Dr. Bessori, why is that? Can't we just jump right to the nuts and bolts? Well, believe it or not, there's a 15 fold increase and this happened to me for an SIgA insufficiency or deficiency in those who have celiac disease. And the primary marker for diagnosing celiac disease first the path to diagnosis is called tissue transglutaminase IgA. So if I don't make enough immunoglobulin IgA, and then you want to diagnose me against the amount of that, I should have a false negative. And many people do, and that's part of the problem. Mm. Uh, so that's the first step is knowing what that value is. And then there's kind of like this decision tree, clinical decision tree that physicians must make. If the patient has adequate levels or they're high, they should be shunted towards a path of blood work that's kind of classic. And that's the aforementioned tissue transglutaminase IgA. Um, if that is equivocal, if it's negative, great. If it's equivocal and we don't know, they're kind of borderline, then we want to get more specific and measure something called an anti anti uh, endomissile antibody IgA. So that's an EMA antibody. And then if they're very high in the TT IgA, tissue transglutaminase IgA, we can go right to a biopsy. Now that sounds lovely, and that's tied in a little bow in a box, but that's not how celiac disease manifests. Ask anyone, go on Reddit, where I've done Ask Me Anythings on this, and read Dr. Bestory's history on Reddit with celiac disease, and you'll see like thousands of people saying, that's not how it worked for me. And I'm like, I'm with you. And they all shared stories that I started saying on Reddit and in other, in other avenues, and of course, in academic institutions. Individuals can be low in SIGA or be low for their age, right? You could be 18 years old and your SIGA should be in this range and your tests come back as if you're 70. Some doctors are not astute to that or not adroit in the knowledge and just say, okay, let's forget about that. Take two Pepsin and I'll send you off to whatever your main complaint is, right? So then you'll go to that other specialist and then you might into the realm of you're mentally ill and you need like an antidepressant or something or an anti, you know, anxiety. Um, and meanwhile, we just haven't been diagnosed. So understand first and foremost, the, the duration to diagnosis is a minimum of 10 years. You got that? It takes people 10 years to fully get diagnosed. I was born and suffering with symptoms since I was five. I was formally diagnosed about 15 years later. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, and all blood decisions are made on that IgA result. So if you're very low and deficient, or you're low for your age group, you should have a completely separate set of blood work. And I wrote a whole article on this in layman's terms that I'd share with you. Um, but I would then run a tissue transglutaminase IgG in addition to the gold standard IgA, as well as a different type of blood work known as a glidin deaminated antibody IgA and IgG. This is a completely different form of reaction to gluten. In gluten and celiac disease, you react to glidin and glutidin, two proteins found in gluten. So it's really glidin, that's the primary problem. And you need to be very intelligent when you're working up a patient, or if you're a patient and you wanna be an advocate for your own healthcare, which is my mantra and my platform, and you should then tell your doctor. I literally wrote an article that I say, print this and bring this to your doctor so that you can then get the right course of blood work. Um, and the last, I'm sorry, please, Brian. Okay, no, I was just gonna say, um my question now to you is if, if diagnosed, what, what should they do as far as, um, you know, overcoming something like this, or is it something you live with and you just have to just change the foods that you eat? Yeah, you have, this is a lifelong, there's no cure at this time. Um, I am a member of a group called uh, celiac, uh, org, and it is the celiac disease foundation. It's a nonprofit. I'm what's called a patient advocate for them. Mm -hmm. Um, along with a dear friend of mine and colleague, he's a Dr. Joseph Murray of the Mayo clinic. 
he's the second author of the last paper that I published. And Dr. Murray and I worked really hard on trying to improve diagnostics and physician understanding. But what we do say at the end of the day is while there's a lot of drug trials that have transpired and failed and more on the way, at the end of the day, what we know as doctors is the only thing you could do to treat this disease is be on a 100% militant gluten-free diet. There is nothing else you could do. And yes, and there's some- easy, And it's become easier and easier, right? I'd like to think it's come easier and easier, Brian, but I do think it's the age of those who are diagnosed, not being ageist in any way, shape or form. I'm just saying that I do believe there's some people that are stuck to their guns and that could transpire at any age, right? And, and where how you grow up. There's 20 year olds that get a diagnosis that I participate in and then they're in shock and there's seven year olds that would rather take courses of steroids and mm. hide this from other physicians and just live their life as it's slowly killing them. Cause please do not let me pull punches, Brian. This isn't a, my tummy hurts and I'm sick. This does cause multiple sclerosis, various autoimmune diseases. One of the worst things it does is it causes small intestinal cancer which is why I'm a fan of what we do in the United States which is the gold standard of the final diagnosis is a biopsy. And my European colleagues, whom I love and respect, they follow a path of serological diagnostics, particularly in pediatrics, where they just use specific blood work. And I can talk about that um, as deep as you want me to go. And in this country, the reason we pursue this is there's not enough standardization of every lab to meet the criteria of being tenfold over for a diagnostic value. And we're so afraid of missing things that we see in that biopsy. I've had patients come to me over the years when I worked in internal medicine. I've been in internal medicine, endocrinology, cardiology, and infectious disease. So in all those years, I've had such a wealth of information seeing patients uh, with this disease and just being diagnosed with this, 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 this disease due to my passion and wanting to, to figure it out and identify it. I've had patients come to me and say, I was diagnosed with celiac disease after my small intestinal cancer diagnosis. Mm. Because while my intestinal sample after surgery and chemo went to get biopsied, they also found the original cause of it was celiac disease. Celiac mm. disease causes small intestinal cancer if not diagnosed and treated on time. So like what for you, what What's your typical eating routine then? What type of foods do you eat and what type of foods do you avoid and that you recommend? Well, yeah, that, oh boy, that, we, we're, we're opening a big can now, but <laughs> we, might be taking a, we might be taking a turn because I'll talk about a study that I did in 2015 and my firm belief in an area of uh, research that I personally love, okay? So everybody do their thing and work with your doctors and work with your specialists. What works for me and my celiac disease, obviously completely removing barley, rye, oats, which are contaminated with gluten primarily and wheat um, and spelt and triticale and all the cousins and family members of gluten. I did go one step further um, based on academic research. I, I fell in love with the publications that were coming out on more of hunter gatherer type research and nutrition. The first paper I read was in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1984, and that kind of blew my mind. And then I read one that was picked up by, who became a really good friend of mine, Dr. Lauren Cordain. We've known each other for a long time. Mm. One of my highlights of my life was how, endorsing him to come on board for an academic lecture where he won the lecture of the year. That was back in 2004. Mm. Um, and our friendship stayed really strong and I'm so honored that I got to interview him uh, for a podcast episode and we just had a blast. And, talked for like three hours and only published like 90 minutes of that. So some of my favorite moments. So I read everything Dr. Cordain ever published and, and how he, you might say, how did you get on your radar? One of his popular books, not at all. Do I sound like a popular book guy, Brian? No. Um, I actually read in 1999, I read a paper he wrote called Serial Grains, Humanity's Double-Edged Sword. It had 355 references. And I said, um, I love this guy. And he talked a lot about my disease and the genesis of my disease. And he said something that knocked me off my chair at the time. He said, imagine having the genetic predisposition for celiac disease, because that's the only way you get it. You have to have the genes and then the immunological reaction. He said, imagine if you had the genetic predisposition and were never exposed to gluten. Imagine if you lived in one of these civilizations mm -hmm. and you never were exposed. And I'm just sitting there, imagine those words. And I had grand mal seizure disorders no one could diagnose. Couldn't drive a car by the time I was 18 and a half with these seizures. Um, had severe heart arrhythmias that I was multiple medications and the most brilliant mind in modern minds, plural in modern medicine, couldn't solve my case. Mm. And it was what I was eating. So 
you ask to answer the question based on all my research and studying 216 hunter gatherer societies, I adopted a very strict hunter gatherer uh, lifestyle of eating. And I only consumed foods that were pre agrarian age. Um, and that's basically how I live to this day. So uh, what's your typical, what's a day? Uh, for okay. my breakfast this morning, um, I had three eggs and sliced avocado um, with a quarter cup of blueberries. Mm -hmm. um, my lunch today will be grass-fed steak around eight ounces. Um, I'm blessed working at home and I moved to Southern California last year. So I'll be able to grill that in my own backyard, mm. uh, which is really nice with a big mound of arugula, which I will use um, extra virgin olive oil and lemons from my own lemon tree in my backyard as the dressing. Uh, so I'm really kind of living off the land as best as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and a repeat of that, uh, believe, I have to talk to my wife what we're doing, but I think I might be doing roast chicken tonight with roast uh, vegetables, all uh, you know, pre-agricultural type years. Um, agribusiness, I should say. And cooking, uh, and then, cooking for yourself is a huge advantage, right? Because obviously going out to eat could be you know, a puzzling thing. And you know, like you said, they, they put gluten things that you wouldn't think they were in. Yeah, there's some very famous, um, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but they're public stories. So people could easily just Google some of the sound bites I'm saying. There's very famous stories about people being put into a position where they could not eat out mm -hmm. and then actually getting their diagnosis. And one of the most famous, famous stories is a young woman who used to be on a talk show on Channel 7, uh, and the East Coast was Channel 7, uh, called ABC, ABC, mm -hmm. uh, called The View. And she was on a uh, series of Survivor. And she was not going to the grocery store and buying what she normally did. And she was eating off the land as best as she could and never felt better. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh my God, well, everybody's wilting away. She's like, this is amazing. And she ended up coming back uh, to, I believe it was New York and a good colleague of mine made the diagnosis. I worked with Dr. Peter Green for years out of Columbia Presbyterian, referring patients back and forth. So Peter was brilliant. He made the diagnosis um, and she found out she had celiac. Mm -hmm. So I've been hearing a lot of that, believe it or not, during COVID. Um, yeah. I've pushed to get people diagnosed just as they were changing their lifestyle. And they were like, oh my God, this is phenomenal. Uh, and cooking for yourself, I think has a great advantage. And back when I lived, uh, so you should know, Brian, I lived in Manhattan. I actually lived in Hell's Kitchen in mm -hmm. New York City for the bulk of my life and the, my entire marriage through my, my beautiful wife of almost 17 years. And we had to eat out a lot. And I had like a spread for everyone. And once we kind of figured out our favorite and best places, it was just constantly discussing with these individuals um, what I can and cannot eat and making sure they really understood it. And, and, and I got pumped a lot. I got sick a lot uh, mm. while, while eating out in, in different environments. And I would talk about that when anyone would ask me on podcasts, et cetera. So this is during COVID-19 um, here in the lockdown during the coronavirus years, year, uh, I, I was able to uh, completely live a life where I never experienced any exposure to gluten. Would you advise most people in general, like you see, like um, Dr. Gundry's book, um, you know, regarding nightshades and, and the different proteins that you're talking about as well with gluten and glide. And um, would you advise that for most people eating an ancestral diet is probably the way to go in general, whether you have it, whether you have it or not. It's, it's, if you said to me is, do you feel that that is the healthiest way we should be eating as humans? My answer would be yes. Uh, because there's such a great volume of evidence towards some of these other food groups that are so new to humanity being associated with other problems, mm -hmm. but we don't find that in, in except in very extreme syn syndromes and cases, um, with more hunter gatherer foods. I was on a podcast, um, that was hosted by one of the hosts was Sean Baker. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, he's for, coming on soon. I got him. Coming yeah. On. So Sean, Sean is a really, he's a really lovely guy. And, you know, uh, just, I had a blast. He treated me like just with the most beautiful respect and as a colleague, and he let me say it was on my mind and respected my credentials and my education. And I greatly appreciate that. Um, because I feel the same way about Sean. I thank him for his service, being a you know, military guy and getting a phenomenal education. Um, but, but it's interesting because we, we kind of touched and really connected with hey, in ex only extreme cases, has meat been a problem, right? If you're bit by the long star tick and you're one of the few people that have a rare form of Lyme disease, you can develop alpha glial syndrome and you can develop this uh, anaphylactic reaction to beef. Right. That's an extreme circumstance. And I'm proud to say, and I could be wrong, but I didn't think Sean knew about that until I was on his show. Mm -hmm. Just saying that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Ask him, ask him when you see him. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said hello. Uh, but, but outside of that extreme circumstance, 
uh, Brian, it, it's, you could look up clinical studies between dairy and type one diabetes, and you could find these other instances. There's whole papers just on how legumes can be problematic in the gastrointestinal tract and blocking the absorption of, of key nutrients. Um, there's a textbook I keep next to me and it's called Understanding Normal and, and uh, uh, Clinical Nutrition. And in there, there's actually a section on phytates and zinc binding and young kids in India that look like nine-year-olds, like teenagers in India when they just consume pulses and they get no zinc uh, or their zinc sequestering by phytates, they end up becoming deficient and having low testosterone production, et cetera. So you don't see that in the food realm of hunter-gatherers unless someone has a specific reaction towards a, a food in that realm. Right. Yeah. And um, now my other thought that I thought we could talk a little bit about is gut health. Um, like, sure, said, yeah, yeah. Just cause it's, uh, obviously we know how important it is and, um, what, what would you, what, what things do you advise people for gut health? Um, you know, I know like, you know, you talked to Dr. Sean Baker regarding like the carnivore diet, the ultimate probably elimination diet per se. Right. But, there, but, you know, you call it an elimination diet, but really there's probably a lot of things that we shouldn't be eating that we are. So it's probably more of a normal diet for, for, that could be great for a lot of people. Um, but what is your thought on gut health and fiber and things like that? Yeah. And, and look, I do think that's where I may differ from, from other people um, only because we can't deny the great evidence on fiber. And I do believe in uh, plants that are paleolithic uh, in their, in their era, more hunter gatherer to be more accurate with my vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, you heard all my meals had some type of a plant component to them. And I do believe in that. And I do believe in the nutritional composition of these plants and, I, um, I, I, I know that we evolved eating these plants. So that is where I'm getting my basis of recommendations. So that's important to understand. We didn't evolve eating, you know, easy bread uh, that's found in a market that's supposed to be so healthy and this sprouted grain bread. We didn't evolve on that. So we didn't move the needle and we survived that long, right? Eating animal proteins and these types of plants. And we found out what plants bothered us by getting really sick and knew to kind of avoid those. So I'm a big fan of the fibers and the components that are found in these plants because they've been found to, and then spent a lot of time studying the microbiota, they've been found to help foster the growth of good species. So there's just enormous studies on healthy bacteria. There was just a, even a Wall Street Journal brought to my attention by a patient said, look, it's finally making mainstream what you're teaching. There was a study on um, psychobiotics published in the journal Nutrition in 2017. And then the Wall Street Journal is talking about it just a couple of weeks ago on how important probiotics and good bacteria can be in our gut. And it's not as simple as just taking the species, right? Mm -hmm. We learned about that from a species known as Anchormancia, which is strongly associated with turning off certain autoimmune disease conditions um, in the gut. It's linked to potentially being beneficial in multiple sclerosis. But in these studies, if you just give someone Anchormancia, it doesn't grow, it doesn't flourish. These species have to kind of bore into the mucosal lining like a Phillips head screwdriver. And what we found is that they have other species that work with them and relatives and it takes a village as well as prebiotics like seeding a lawn, they then can proliferate on their own. So I, I'm a big believer, all intents and purposes, understanding an individual's weakness to whatever food. I've met people that react to lettuce. I've met people that if they eat an avocado, they turn you know a shade of red and feel like they're going to die. I get that. Having said that, removing any extraneous food substance, regardless of the source, and then having individuals eat more like a hunter gatherer that is replete in plant based foods to get all these fibers and prebiotics, you do notice a better and a healthier microbiota. And um, when you include reactive substances, because that was one of the, the things I wrote about extensively during my tenure at Rutgers and then over at Eastern Michigan, I talked about how you could identify someone with celiac disease characteristics just by the type of species growing in their gastrointestinal tract. They had different dominance of other species. They had less beneficial flora. And this is a volume of data. And, and look, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here uh, Brian, where my university, one of my alma maters had like terabytes of data on the microbiome. All our work was, you know, one of my classes was literally called um, remapping the human genome. Like <laughs> that wasn't an art class, nothing wrong with art. I'm just saying <laughs> there, there was no cliff notes for that type of work. So you do, you cannot, and you can't ignore the microbiome when, when you're looking at the human body. Uh, and the last note I'd say on that is um, we have more uh, cells of species growing in the gastrointestinal tract than we have cells as 
a species. So it's kind of like who's steering the ship. It's really kind of cool when you think about it, right? You have just trillions of cells and organisms in your intestines and you as a human being have less. Wow. All right, back. We had a little disruption. Um, but going back to gut health, what uh, I know there's a lot of research out there. What, what, what regarding probiotics and prebiotics? I know some people are like believers of them and some people are just totally shun them. Um, what is your thought around that? Uh, I look, I, I, my work is really kind of interesting. Um, so I look at the specifics of what's transpiring in an individual uh, and it's part of my doctoral education. So a chunk of my work um, was on something known as clinical informatics, which has another term for it, which is known as translational medicine, mm -hmm. which you then can explain as something called precision medicine. So it's finding, I can tell you the mantra of one of our professors, finding the right drug for the right individual at the right dose at the right time, right? And, and mm -hmm. then of course, all of those separate statements have a different substrate. The right time could mean everything from chronological age, biological age, hormonal sequence and frequency, and one of the uh, images, though we were very academic in our work, um, one of my, I was trained by um, Miramoto Shibata, who's one of the most brilliant minds in cancer research and genetics. He actually started the first cancer gene think tank over at University of Buffalo. So imagine studying with that guy. So brilliant, <laughs> brilliant man, um, honored uh, to have him as a professor. And we talked about finding the specifics. So then if you go further into my work, I really delve into what an individual's microbiota is revealing and measuring their genetics. Uh, there's some great companies out of Germany um, that are able to use PCR analysis to basically GI map the gastrointestinal tract through stool samples, multiple stool samples, and then quantify what species they have, what species they don't have. And that's, that's how I make my decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say this is 100% ready to go and endorsed? No, and if we waited for that wheel, we'd get nowhere. Right. We're all learning right now in our world how science really should work, right? There's an infection that's wiping out people. Um, I fled, fled is the wrong term, but it sounds dramatic and fun. I fled New York City right before the apocalypse. All my colleagues thought I knew something. I did not. I left in December, moved to California uh, just for my daughter's life and her having a backyard. We lived on the 47th floor. You can't just run out and play. Right. Um, and she's going to a phenomenal school here. Uh, so we ended up in Southern California and who knew that became the biggest state. So I left the biggest state of infection to the current biggest state. But my point is the rapid uh, movement of science way faster than we ever did before because there were no governing bodies interfering as aggressively as normal, whatever the argument is on which side you stand to get something done and to do something safe and effective. That's how I operate my life. How much data is on the side of this makes sense and it's real. And I can talk to a patient saying, this is what I think right now. And this is what the science says versus ignoring it and just saying this has no value. Well, that side of the argument doesn't exist. If you go to pubmed.gov, which is where only an individual should go to search for scientific studies, um, we see the value of various probiotic therapies. I prefer to know what an individual has before I give them something. And when I do that, I see dramatic changes in their health and function. And then as far as the gut's concerned, what about um, fasting? Um, something that I'm a big proponent of. I do a lot of fasting myself um, because uh, what are your thoughts around that? And, and do you do any type of fasting? Uh, I, I personally um, do not do any type of fasting. I know it's excellent and healthy. I've tried to do it. Uh, and this is something, by the way, if you want to know my background with fasting, uh, I, I had a podcast with Grant Tinsley. If anyone's a fan of, of fasting and you don't know Dr. Grant Tinsley, you're doing it wrong. Uh, I say that with respect. Dr. Grant Tinsley is out of um, uh, Texas, uh, Texas Tech. He's a brilliant, brilliant mind. Um, I spent an hour with him and we continued our friendship and he published probably the most downloaded paper on fasting and maintaining the muscle mass during a fasting state. So the, the only reason I haven't been able to do it is I think my years of undiagnosed celiac disease absolutely destroyed so many things on my own body. For a period of time, I had the mimicking of type 1 diabetes and the mimicking of type 2 diabetes. The bottom line is no matter how hard I tried with my education and knowledge base, I get extremely sick um, to the point of like, I will vomit. Uh, sorry to be graphic again, Brian. You're, gonna, you're never going to have me back, buddy. 
Uh, so, <laughs> it just got extremely queasy. And it's one of the cool things about, and I never brought that up with Grant on like a public forum, but we talked about it privately. And he's like, yeah, it's a very individualized thing. And that's where I really listen to people when they tell me things, right? I listen to people who even say to me, Dr. Pastor, you're such an advocate, you know, grass fed meat. Um, and, and you eat more of any doctor I've ever known, but I, I can't do that. Like, I just don't feel well this way. And I'll try to find out why, Brian, like I'll find, well, you know, you don't have enough lipase and you don't digest this that well. And your pancreatic elastase one is, is a, you know, it's a great biological marker, according to the Mayo Clinic for how well a person can unfold proteins. Of course, you're having trouble. We could do these things to help there. Uh, for me, it hasn't, it hasn't worked in any of my efforts. So I just try to eat only when I'm hungry and only the foods that I like. And I can tell your listening audience at 51 with a three-year-old toddler, I can, I feel like I can run through a wall and I'm hoping you can feel my energy. Uh, and I, that's just, I'm obviously doing something right uh, for me. Um, but, but seriously, I practice on patients. I'm a big believer in intermittent fasting. And my favorite is definitely um, having patients subtract the meat having patients have an extended period of going without food and consuming food at like a, a lunch to dinner type timeline. Right. What I have seen there is unbelievable from um, a hypercholesterolemia a pathway, which means elevated um, blood lipids to normalizing glucose and hemoglobin A1C, which is a long-term measurement of a damaged glucose on um, a hemoglobin, which is a bad marker and it accelerates aging. Um, and, and to generally feeling well. So I practice that advice on basically a daily basis. Mm. And uh, what are your, th I like to ask this, what are your thoughts around dairy? <laughs> um, wow. You know, some people can, t I know it's probably a, 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 maybe could be a long conversation, but mm -hmm. yeah, what are your thoughts around dairy? Yeah, you know, it, it, and this is going to go back to, I'm about to make a whole bunch of enemies. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to start by saying I personally have not consumed dairy since I was 19. Uh, I'm 51. Uh, I hate dairy with a passion. Um, and you'll say, just why? Out of reading papers? No. Um, I was very sick from my disease. And the one thing I couldn't solve when I thought I was well, finding out celiac disease was associated with my heart disease, associated with my seizures, associated with neurological symptoms that were physical, like numbness and tingling. I was being tested for MS. It was a nightmare of doctors after doctors. Uh, they didn't have MRI, so I had like a brain x-ray to my chronic migraines. Nothing would fix my chronic migraines until I was able to study the potential link between the milk protein group casein and migraine incidents. And I met a couple of doctors that believed in that. And I said, I think I'm going to pursue this path. And I ended uh, a 17 year suffering bout. My first migraine was the age of five. I remember laying on my grandmother's lap while she, she brushed my hair coming out of kindergarten to my last migraine was at the age of 22. So imagine that suffering. I even took my SATs to get into college with an, uh, a covering one eye and having a full aura. Um, yeah, wow. it was a miserable experience. Thank <laughs> God it turned out okay. But wow. when I found that connection, as you could imagine, you hate it. And, and please keep in mind, I used the, quoting another textbook, Food Hypersensitivities and Adverse Reactions um, wow. by Fieri uh, as one of the, the editors of that textbook it was really following the gold standard of academics. So then I went and got skin tested and I was positive for milk proteins, um, alpha lactoglobulin, beta lactobumin, that means whey, and the casein group. So I said, whoa, first hit. Then I did what they say to do in the textbook, even though I wanted to murder them. Now you got a diagnosis, let's test your blood and then let's eliminate it and reintroduce it. Tested my blood, I was off the charts. Then I was free from my pain. And then with my doctor, I said, okay, I'm ready to do it. I had a little bit of dairy products. I had a piece of cheese. Then I had a little bit of milk. And within 36 hours, I had like the worst migraine of my life. Mm. I was non-responsive to injectable Imitrex or all the drugs. I wrote it out. It was horrible. And that was my last exposure. And I was a believer. And then I started working with some colleagues and doctors. I remember getting a couple of cases from um, headache specialists at Johns Hopkins um, and just trying to sleuth. And dairy came up multiple times. In addition to that, absolute assault on dairy by me. <laughs> in addition to that was again, going back, reverting to my colleague, uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain and, and a lot of his writings. And, and keep in mind, if you're a real believer in Lauren Cordain, you read his published studies in peer reviewed academic literature that met the assault of peer reviewed literature committees, like mm -hmm. I have, right? And then read all the researchers he's quoting in his papers and then go and read those papers. So at the end of that massive exercise, 
while doing keeping up with my own studies, mind you, uh, I came to the conclusion that not only was dairy wrong for me, but it may be really solid advice when talking to individuals if they're asking me generally, would it make sense to try a dairy elimination diet? Right. And, and would you say for most people, that's like one of the first steps you'll do with people is, is elimination diets and see, you know, see what's potentially triggering whatever, you know, they're getting. You know, this is where it's really, this is really tricky. Mm. Um, I really love data as best as we can get. And mm. I like to look at what's out there. So there has been some research published in Yale. Uh, for example, I just worked up a case of irritable bowel syndrome and I was called by physicians to assist because they said, look, you know, this person is functioning bowel, but they have all these symptoms. We're classifying them as what's known as IBSC, which is a form of irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. But let's be honest, irritable bowel syndrome means we can't find a medical cause and this person's suffering. So we're going to give them various drugs based on which criteria lane they fit in. If it's a ton of diarrhea, we're going to dry them up and stop their bowel movements, but we're not going to fix any other symptoms. If they have constipation, we're going to give them accelerants and irritants so that they have more peristalsis and they have to evacuate their bowels more frequently, albeit most likely uncomfortably so, right? Mm -hmm. So working up that type of case, being very adroit in the clinical literature, I read like, oh God, 20 to 30 journals, a minimum every three days on various topics of interest. I have various flags set up. I'm always studying. And back in 2017, the first paper came out of the Yale School of Medicine identifying um, leukocyte activation towards specific foods and how versus a sham diet, meaning it was double blind placebo, um, they had a cure rate of IBS by 83%. Mm. So I've tried that. Um, I'm a big believer in classic IgE immunoglobulin reactions and mast cell reactions with skin scratch tests. So I've sent one, another recent case was sending patients off to University of Pennsylvania. They have a dynamite department there that'll do um, scratch tests and actually test histamine reactions, mast cell reactions to a group of foods or chemical agents. And then what that does, Brian, is it helps me shorten the list. Right. And a lot of times I'll do that if the patient will listen, right? What do they say? Know your audience. So if the patient says, Dr. Pastore, I'd like to practice really healthy nutrition based on the principles I've listened to your podcast, or I read about you in an interview, or Dr. Cordain or someone else said, you might want to talk to this guy. Mm -hmm. I'll start with paleolithic platform or hunter gatherer platform, and then do the aforementioned things to whittle down because people can react and people can react to beef in, in again, albeit rare instances, it is possible, right? You, you sure. never want to not listen to what an intelligent person is telling you about their own health. And um, what would you say? One more thing, nuts, uh, nuts, seeds. You know, I, I hear d different camps go back and forth regarding that. What's your thoughts around them? Yeah, and I think it's an individual approach. Um, yeah. I think if you were to, so I'm at, I'm at Eastern Michigan, let's go back in time, and I'm doing a research paper for uh, zinc status and the phytate to zinc ratio in inner cities in Detroit. And I want to look at phytate load. So phytate load is pretty hidden. I actually had to basically sign my life away legally. I'm kidding. And I'm being, you know, I'm being funny with my language, but it was really intense. I had to sign this academic and legal document with the University of Minnesota to get access to this phytate database that was extremely the most accurate at the time um, that shared the phytate content of foods. And nuts are pretty high up on that list. Um, you know, like wheat bran is number one, but like almonds are definitely up there. So in instances with individuals complaining of gastrointestinal symptoms, raw nuts can be a problem for some people. Dry roasting can help them there. There's definitely frequency of nut allergies that are on the rise. If you look at very academic groups of allergy, asthma, and immunology, I have found um, there's a young phenom heading towards PGA and I identified a nut reaction and then sure enough, he had exposure and had anaphylactic type reaction and needs EpiPens everywhere. So there's definitely an increase in that type of reaction. And I wish I could tell you the exact reason why, perhaps our environment, pesticides, who knows, uh, but it's happening. And I think it's an individualized approach. Do I have nuts in my diet? I do in small quantities. So I'm one of the lunatics that on occasion will take out the quarter cup measuring out of my wow. drawer and I will measure a quarter cup of macadamia nuts. Mm -hmm. And I will sit on occasion and have like just that as long as there's no cottonseed oil or uh, that belongs in genes, not food. Uh, so, <laughs> right. You want to avoid those. Fighting. You want to avoid those seed oils, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan. Um, the, and and again, someone might say that's like hypocrisy, or look at the individual studies on those. 
and how they can be beneficial and they have beneficial um, substances in them. Well, when you read the materials and methods, we're not looking at other things. We're looking at the fact that someone might publish sesame seeds are a wonderful source of gamma linolenic acid. Gamma linolenic acid known as GLA might have some anti-inflammatory effects. It might truncate negative estrogens and we can go on a diatribe about that, but no one ever said, what's the ramifications of consuming toasted sesame oil in a diet? Does it increase lipid peroxides? Does it have these negative deleterious effects? Is it using and robbing us of vitamin E? And you can go on a whole long list and then having negative consequences. So just my instinct told me that didn't make logical sense. Mm -hmm. It was equivalent to, I don't, you can't ever get me to buy a couple of things that come out there because they don't scientifically work. For example, red meat is not healthy. Incorrect. I remember working in internal medicine. My first paper for the group of internal medicine years ago was literally called red meat is safe. I kid you not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the head of the medical department published it because they knew, and I used academic literature to back it up. And, and then of course there's some common sense that you then back up with clinical literature. We evolved eating, if I evolved on Lucky Charms, I wouldn't exist. I evolved on meat. Meat does, is, does not cause problems in the human being. If it's a grass-fed, healthy meat, not bastardized, farm-raised garbage, just really is a safe, healthy food. So you're never gonna get me to buy that. And then you'll never get me to buy, oh my God, uh, so-and-so's cholesterol is high. The first thing you better do is cut out the eggs. I always think, and I go, wow, did that person pass organic chemistry? Because cholesterol is huge. It's a massive molecule. You're not eating the cholesterol of a chicken and just injecting it into your bloodstream and magically increasing right. your cholesterol. I'm not taking the chicken's cholesterol and magically transforming it into my own bloodstream. It's not how digestion and the human body works. And in the sickest people, Morbidly obese diabetics with absolutely in the stratosphere hemoglobin A1C, by the way, it's a published study according, paraphrasing, paraphrasing, giving them unlimited eggs added to five points on their total cholesterol. Now, for all I know, those unlimited eggs added unlimited toast and jam. <laughs> right, right. So it's a, a poor study, but great study for those of me, of those of us that believe in, in that, in that type of, of false uh, accusation against eggs. And there's, and I could go on, there's hundreds of studies that show that is just a big lie. And it's part of what's transpiring in agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And you never will get me to, to sign up for that belief system. Yeah. Yeah. Meat and eggs. Well, that's good. Cause that makes up a majority of, of what I eat. So, and like you said, you got to get meat from good sources, right? Grass fed, grass finished is, is the way. Yeah. You it, it, you're very, you're correct. And Dr. Cordain wrote a phenomenal paper on grass fed meat versus conventional meat. And if you look at the contents, that's why I love Dr. Cordain and I'll keep mentioning him mm -hmm. is uh, and he's a great friend and colleague. So I want to make sure that that's known by the audience and you know, there's no, there's no profit there. It's just love for right. the individual and like-minded in science. Um, Dr. Cordain is, 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 I'd like to say I'm like him, uh, where we approach things scientifically. He didn't just make an opinion. He went and had said, let's put these foods to the test and examine the comparison of what's in them. And the amount of omega threes that you get and conjugated linolenic acid and so many things you would not normally expect there. And by the way, uh, Brian, this is like a huge thing that many people don't know. When I sat for the certified nutrition specialist exam, which is a real academic credential, mm -hmm. and I was sitting in the rotunda gallery uh, at the hospital for joint diseases, and I'm sitting there and I, I remember um, uh, the professor who was like just monitoring this like massive five hour exam. I looked up and smiled because one of the questions, all this intense math and science and biochemistry, and then there's this one like softball question that was, what food per ounce is the most dense in nutritional content? And grass-fed red meat was one of the options. And I thought this was really cool because there was some humor in the exam there. At the time I took it, it was written by a nephrologist mm -hmm. and I knew they were really anal and they were gonna go nuts. Um, but I just will never forget that moment. And I had this smile and I remember coming up to Dr. Stanley Wallach, rest his soul, he's passed great guy. And he's the one who signed my, my CNS credential when I finally got my paper that's somewhere in this office. Um, and, and he, he said to me, Hey, Dr. Pastore, what was so funny? And I said, the meat question totally <laughs> got me. And it was just a great, and he laughed and, and it was like an agreement. And we were in the know 
And then look at the latest information that just came out in pediatric recommendations by the Department of Agriculture. Do not withhold meat from your children. Hmm. How cool is that? How cool is that? Yeah, I had a conversation with Marty Kendall. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's got a great blog, but he talks a lot about, he's a big big protein proponent. Um, And, you know, what's your um, thoughts around like fish and what certain type of fish would you recommend? Yeah. And you know what I do? Cause it changes over time. I'm a big fan of recommending the environmental working groups, mercury um, calculator. Right. And they have a website that's free. You don't have to pay any money and you could look at where the fish is at now and actually put in your body weight, your height and the type of fish you're going to eat. And it will spit back what your mercury exposure would be. So I'm not one of the doctors that will ever say, because I actually heard a soundbite on the news by a doctor say, you ready for this? A little bit of mercury is not a problem. That is not true. Uh, I was in internal medicine when mercury thermometers got the FDA ban and we had to raid our practice of those and switch to digital. So number one, that's sad how old I am. And number two, that shows how dangerous mercury can be at any level. And the reason these uh, the metal, toxic metals are so harmful, Brian, first and foremost, is they are molecular mimickers and they behave like important minerals. So mercury behaves like magnesium. Magnesium runs over 300 enzyme systems in the human body. Mercury levels that go over a threshold of normalcy disrupt over 300 different things. Yeah. Problem. And the reason lead is, is it behaves like calcium. Hey, why does a kid eat red lead paint chips and then loses their IQ? Let's think about this. Lead behaves like calcium. We know this study after study after study. You need a voltage gated calcium channel to release a synaptic response, a neurotransmitter out of a synapse. If lead is taking the place there, that does not transpire. We have truncated neurotransmission. We have lower intellectual quotient and other abnormalities. And we know this from bone storage studies on women. Women will be exposed to lead, especially if they were born when we still had leaded gas. And then they, we, they go through menopause and they have a dumping of lead in their system. And many doctors not in the know think, oh my God, did you move? What were you doing? Were you huffing gas? Why is your score so high? Um, you know, they started losing bone. They had a more rapid bone turnover due to the time of life and they dumped all those years of stored lead into their bloodstream and they develop a whole litany of symptoms. So what I believe is look at the environmental working group information. There's some great companies out there that are really smart about safe fish that measure it. Vital Choice is one. I'm not paid by the company. They uh, they do interesting things. They actually measure lime caught tuna and then find out how much mercury is in their stash. They have um, wild caught salmon that's actually really wild caught and it's not a lie. Um, and, And it's verified and they make sure they have tracking papers and that's the type of information that I'll present to, um, to my patients. That's probably where I'm the most strict, especially when dining out, because you could be given some tomfoolery where you're not given the real thing. Um, you know, I had a patient of mine, dear good friend, affluent guy living in Florida. And he, when he said, I don't think I'm getting Dover sole locally here. So I think I'm not going to order that on the menu. <laughs> uh, you know, I could, I, I said, you could be a light bulb. You know, you might want to put your finger in a socket and put a bulb in your mouth. And if it lights, you got mercury. I'm teasing. No <laughs> one do that. No one do that. It's no one do that, humor. please. Yeah. It's a sense of humor, sense of humor. Uh, so yeah, so so mercury levels and they can catch up really quickly. You know, some people are stores and retainers and they don't detoxify um, mercury very well. Right. You know? And and I look for those things too. If someone comes to me and they say, Dr. Pastori, here's the deal. I love hunter gatherer stuff. And I just want you to know I'm going to eat tons of fish on a weekly basis, more accurately pounds. Um, how do you feel about that? I say, fantastic. Let's do a blood mercury, you know, every quarter. Let's use really safe, smart choices that I mentioned today. EWG.org, go to their mercury algorithm, vital choice when you can, and if you can afford it, because it is a little bit more uh, pricier, but worth it. In my humble opinion, food is, is, is currency. Um, and then it would be really cool to maybe look for other things. You know, let's see if you have any MTBE in your system, which is a byproduct added to gasoline in the 70s. And it gives us a clue that you're a retainer or 2-methylhipparate, which is a byproduct of xylene. And these are permanent chemicals that are always going to be on the planet. And uh, I lived in New York City and I don't have any of these things in me. And uh, let me tell you, you probably could tell by my personality. I look, I found a byproduct of DDT in my wife and she was born after they banned DDT. So I really look for stuff. Uh, So if someone's a great excreter of chemicals, there's less of a risk. If someone's a retainer, we really want to monitor their, their mercury. 
And the interesting thing is if you are flagged with very high mercury, actually your state department of health will call you and your doctor before your doctor even calls you. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's scary, but interesting. Yeah. I mean, think about it, right? It's a, again, let me make this clear. It's illegal to have a mercury thermometer in a classroom, but no one's saying, Hey, be careful how much tuna fish you eat. Go to town. Right. Or swordfish tacos, eat those swordfish tacos in the Hamptons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, we could probably talk for hours. We're getting up on it here, but let me yes. ask you one last question. What sure. would you, what advice would you give? What maybe one tip would you give someone if they're, you know, middle age, fifties, 40, fifties, even sixties, and they're looking to maybe they put on maybe 10, 15, 20 pounds and they want to get their body back. What, what maybe one tip would you give them? So putting on muscle mass is what you're saying, correct? Well, what I, I'm I, saying is they've put on weight. Oh, they put on yes, weight. Oh, they put on okay. weight. They want to get their body back. Yeah. I think one of the smartest things to do in, in one soundbite is an amalgam of a hunter gatherer diet that works for you with intermittent fasting. Yeah. I think if you could start there, you could move the needle, even if you're not starting a proper exercise program right for your body right. at this time, you'd be shocked how well that'll work first. If you jump into exercise voraciously, you actually could experience a subsequent increase in your appetite. And if you're still eating harmful foods, you could actually be consuming more calories of the harmful foods than you were as a sedentary individual. So I'm the biggest proponent of exercise. I think it could be a panacea, but it's so important to pursue hunter-gatherer strategic eating with intermittent fasting. Love that, love that. Well, doctor, thanks for coming on. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invite. And it was such a blast talking with you, my friend. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine. And I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.